Uh, welcome to Authors Night with the East Hampton Library. This event is generously sponsored by CIBC Private Wealth Management, the Hilaria and Alec Baldwin Foundation, Patty Kenner, Barbara and Stephen Heyman, Michelle Tortorelli and Tom Kearns, and Janet C. Roth. We are pleased to present Suzanne Samard being interviewed by Victoria Wilson. At the end of this interview, there will be a Q&A, so please feel free to you know, type your questions into the Q&A at the bottom. You can do it now, you can do it later, um, and we'll have the Q&A at the end. Um, so again, just thank you so much for everybody for coming, um, and I hope um, everyone enjoys the discussion. Thank you. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Rebecca Voisage for that. And I also wanna say how great it is to see that library, an actual library in the background. Yes. It warms okay. my heart, which is already <laughs> plenty warm by the heat. But anyway, this is a great night. And I'd like to thank the board, the event board, and all of the board and all of the sponsors for this East Hampton Library, which we support. And in particular, two special women who valiantly give. Uh, they're all for this event year in and year out. And that's Jane Friedman and Patty, the, the great Patty Kenner. And welcome to you all. So pleased you could be here tonight for this extraordinary book and to hear from this extraordinary woman who wrote it and lived it, and that is Suzanne Samard. I'll just say a few words about Suzanne and the book. And <clears throat> Finding the Mother Tree is one of those rare books that changes the way we look at trees, forests, and life itself. Suzanne is the world's leading forest ecologist, professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia faculty of forestry and she has forever changed how people view trees and their connections to one another and to other living things in the forest. Suzanne is a pioneer on the frontier of plant communication and intelligence. You've been compared to Rachel Carson, hailed as a scientist who conveys complex technical ideas in a way that is dazzling and profound and that is true. Your work has influenced filmmakers uh, such as James Cameron's The Tree of Souls in Avatar, storytellers Richard Powers' The Overstory, and your TED Talks have been seen by more than 10 million people worldwide. Um, by this point, it's, I'm sure it's many more. In Finding the Mother Tree, Samard brings us into her world, the intimate world of the trees in which you brilliantly illuminate the fascinating and vital truths the trees are not simply the source of timber or pulp, a complicated interdependent circle of life, that forests are social cooperative creatures connected through underground networks by which trees communicate their vitality and vulnerabilities with communal lives that are not that different from ours. And your research, just a bit more about you, and then we'll start the conversation. Your research has been written about in the New York or the Atlantic, National Geographic, Smithsonian. Uh, it's been on CNN, BBC, The Daily Mail, Globe and Mail, The Times, etc. And what started as a legacy, then a place of childhood home, solace and adventure has grown into a full understanding of the intelligence of the forest. And in this book, you take us on a path of your inquiry and discovery, and we follow each piece of evidence as it leads to another. And we will never look at trees in the same way again. <clears throat> now, uh, you were born in the, there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, in the Monashi Mountains of British Columbia, which is a range extending north 200 miles from the Washington US boundary. And when we were speaking the other day, you were, we were on the phone, you were talking about how you could see five fires around your town in British Columbia of Nelson. And these are fires that are along the west coast of Oregon and Washington and extending upwards. And of course, it's the dryness and the droughts. I call it planet change, not climate change, because that's what's happening, um, that are at issue. But what specifically is going on? Yeah, I mean, I guess most people would have seen a couple of days ago that the United Nations just declared a climate emergency in the world. Can you hear me? Um, and yes, th this is this is what we're experiencing. Um, you know, we've had a, this what they call a heat dome in the West pretty much since 
May. Um, the whole summer has been extraordinarily hot in the West. And, you know, under temperatures that are, you know, so profound there, I mean, hitting literally 50 degrees Celsius in some towns, which I, I guess is, I'm not, that's probably like 120 Fahrenheit. Um, at those kinds of temperatures, most, most stuff will burn. Um, you, the other, you know, the other thing for a burn, you need ignition. And so we do have plenty of ignition sources, people, um, but any kind of slight ignition will set a fire under those conditions. But the third factor is the fuel. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, fuel is, is the stuff in the forest that burns. It's the wood, it's the, it's the understory, it's the overstory. And uh, over the, the last hundred years um, through um, forest management, particularly forest fire suppression, we've had a buildup of fuels in our forests. And so we really have like all these things coming together with a lot of fuel, these really hot temperatures, and then, you know, various ignitions, which are, you know, literally these fires are so big. They're mega fires and they're creating their own climate. They're creating lightning storms, which is actually igniting even more fires. And so now, you know, right now in British Columbia, we have about 300 fires burning, of which a large portion are out of control. Um, and, you know, we're in another heat wave. And so this is not probably not going to stop until, until October. This is very unusual, um, but it's not unusual in the last decade. So we've been seeing this ramping up, ramping up, you know, occasionally we'll have a nice cool wet year, but that's become an anom anomaly. Now these hot dry summers are the normal. Um, this is the new normal. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that in addition to this, I think one of the consequences is we're seeing some human migrations already, climate mig climate refugees, even within mm -hmm. Canada, moving to the coast. You know, it was so funny. It's like the coast moved to the, in the inland to get away from COVID, and now they've rushed all back to the coast because of the fires. And so those are two, you know, global change migrations, human migrations that are quite massive. So these, these fires are consequential. They're adding to the climate problem. Um, but then how do we mitigate that? So there, it's, it's, it's a major wicked problem. You know, um, before we go on, somebody is saying that there's no audio. I can hear you and you can hear me. So I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that there isn't a problem. Um, <clears throat> some overall uh, button mm -hmm. that has to be pressed. But, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to, I mean, this we will get to trees in a second, but... Mm -hmm. uh, but this, since this is around your forests, I just was the melting of the major ice sheets in Greenland mm -hmm. and Antarctica. Are those at all are those at all related to what's happening? Yes, yes. It, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's all connected. <laughs> that is one of the themes of my book. But it's definitely connected in a climate sense. In that, you know, with the melting of the the Greenland ice shield. And also the calving off of large ice ice sheets in Antarctica in the last ten years um, it has really um, you know it's changed ocean temperatures and it's changed the the ocean circulation patterns are changing um, and this is what people were afraid of that you we would hit you know once once the ocean circulation patterns start changing then the jet stream changes um, and this is all happening all at the same time and I think that. Even the climate scientists are a little surprised that it's coming on so quickly. But here we are. You know, we have this heat dome that we're experiencing this summer is a result of the shift of the, the jet, jet stream, which is linked to the melting of the of the of the ice sheets. Right. OK, so, um, you know, let's start off with just talking a little bit about mother trees, what they do and how you found how, how you found them. You, you write, you say, majestic hubs at the center of forest communication, protection, and sentience. Um, so talk a little bit about what they are. And Okay, yeah. And I, I'm going to link it to the fire question as well to keep the flow here. Good, um, good. Yeah, so so mother trees are just the biggest trees in the forest. They're, they're, they're the elder trees. So a lot of forests have multi, multiple ages, many ages of trees. Um, you know, these are old forests where, where new trees regenerate in the, under the understory of the old trees. You know, they're communities, multi-age communities. 
And these big old trees have many, many functions. But one of the things is that they, they have these fungal networks. We call them, they're mycorrhizal. So these are fungi that live below ground. Um, they're one of several groups of fungi. There's, there's other groups include the decay fungi, the saprotrophs. Some are pathogens. This is called a mycorrhiza, and it's a symbiont that is a mutualist. So that means that the tree uh, and the fungus both benefit from this relationship. So mycorrhiza li literally means fungus root. And how it works is that this, these enormous trees with their huge crowns, you know, they have massive photosynthetic capacity, huge energy moving from the crowns down the stems into their massive root systems and feeding this fungal network. And the fun fungi take that energy, that photosynthetic energy and grow through the soil, picking up nutrients and water and bringing it back to the tree. And then they, they trade. And trees have entered into this, this relationship over evolutionary time because it makes, you know, it energetically makes sense. It's a lot cheaper energetically to build a fungal network to build a bunch of roots, which requires lignin and cellulose and so on. Whereas a fungus has got a very thin hyaline cell wall, it's cheap to construct and, you know, they're just really efficient at getting into the tiny pores of the soil. So these big old trees, they have more to them than that even. So they are the connectors of the forest. They're like a nucleus of the forest. And they're connected to the, all the different ages of trees coming up. Um, the network that they support, this fungal network, provides those trees, those regenerating trees with water and nutrients. And the old trees, the mother trees, also directly subsidize the little seedlings coming up with carbon and nitrogen and water until they can become more self-sufficient. And so these, these big old trees, they live for great, like great ages. The oldest trees, I think mother trees in the world would be 5,000 years old. Um, I was just at Fairy Creek, which is a, a forest on Vancouver Island, which is currently under protest. Um, there is, a, and I visited a, a, an old matriarch in the forest. Um, her name is Titania, and she's about 2,000 years old. So these trees, they grow to great, great ages. But even so, um, even in younger forests, it's just the biggest, oldest trees that are these hubs, these network, these networking trees, these mother trees. To bring it back to the forest, these old, old trees, they have thick bark, they have tall crowns, they have deep water or deep roots. They bring water from the subsoil up to the surface and transpire it out into the crown of the rest of the forest. They do another process called hydraulic lift, where they bring water up and share with the plants around them. And this keeps the forest wet and moist. So when you cut down these big old trees, you actually increase the flammability of the forest because there's less water available. There's less in the crowns, there's less in the trees, there's less in the soil. And what we're finding in the West is that when we clear cut these old trees, um, which is the dominant way that we cut them, clear cutting meaning taking everything, um, and replace them with plantations, which has happened throughout the West, not just Canada, but the US as well, uh, replace them with plantations that are really flammable. And so what we're finding right now in this big, you know, firestorm in the West is a lot of these fires are starting in plantations and they just race through them because they're manicured tree farms that have very flammable trees, no elders, no deciduous trees around them with that have high water content in their leaves. They're extremely vulnerable. And the landscape pattern itself, because of the cutting pattern, funnels those fires and makes them much more ferocious um, than they would otherwise. So the loss of these old trees is profoundly significant in the very survival of our, our forest for the future and for ourselves. I mean, literally, I've been in Nelson, surrounded by fire all summer. I can hardly breathe. It's been a very terrifying summer for all of us in the West. And so, well, first of all, I have to ask you, I mean, a 2000 year old tree, I mean, how do they how do they measure it? I mean, they haven't cut it down, so they don't they can't count the rings. How do they? That's a great question. How do they calculate that? <laughs> yeah, um, there's different ways, um, but the the most common way to 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 measure the age of a tree is you, t you is you take a core and it's called an increment core, and it's like it's like a giant screwdriver, but it's hollow inside, and you screw it into the center of the tree. And then there's an extractor and you extract out this long, uh, this long tube of wood that's got all the tree rings. And you can count those oh tree God. rings. 
And so that's how you do it. Um, when I was at Ferry Creek, there was actually this large stump that the, the protesters had 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 sort of uh, varnished off and, you, and they had counted the rings and the tree was actually hollow in the middle because a lot of these ancient trees are hollow in the middle. Their heartwood has decayed and, and they're actually, when they're hollow like that, they provide dens for bears, which is really cool. Um, but the part that was not hollowed, the, the outer part was a thousand years old. And so the inner part that had hollowed out, we were just guessing was about 2000 years of missing rings. And that's where the bears were living. Um, but yeah, that, that's how you do it. And another way, sorry, Vicky, I'm gonna add one more thing. Um, we can also measure the age of the last fire disturbance in forests using carbon-14 dating. And in these particular forests on the west coast of North America, in these rainforests, a lot of these forests started just past, just after the last ice age. They have not burned for over 12,000 years. And we figured that out from carbon dating. And so these ancient, ancient soils are full, chock full of carbon that has been, you know, basically fed there by these old, old trees. And the soil is actually older than the trees because they they kind of turn over. The old ones get ancient, they get ancient, they die, but the new ones are already started under their crowns and they come up and they take over. And it's just this cycling on these ancient soils. So, yeah. And I, I also have to ask you, this is it's not a scientific question, but what is it like to be, I mean, and I've been in the redwood forests, but, and how old would those trees be, do you think? Yeah, um, I think the redwoods can live to a thousand years as well, um, 2000 years. Well, what is it? I mean, is there, I mean, I don't want to sound whatever, but is there a, a sort of aura of being in the midst of a 2000 year old thing? There, there, there definitely living? is. It is, it, it takes your breath away. When you sit next to something that is old like that, um, you feel the energy of those trees. And, and actually when I was at Ferry Creek, we flew in and my daughter and I, Nava, went into the forest and we sat at the base of Titania, 2000 year old yellow cedar. And, um, and we sat in silence for five minutes and you could feel the energy of Titania rushing through our bodies and through our souls. And, and I was being interviewed at that moment. Um, there were cameras and, and so I had, Titania speak to the cameras through me. I mean, literally, it was a hugely spiritual moment. And when you're in those forests, you are in the full medicine wheel of who you are, your mind, body, spirit, heart, and you can't help but bring your full self to the presence of those trees. They draw it out of you. So one of the things, well, we'll get to Fairy Creek a little later, but... Um... What's so interesting, we're talking about they're sharing water and one of the things, and, and let me just say, because we're, we're gonna get into this to everybody who's listening who may, might not be aware of this, but this whole discovery of this sentient life in the forest in relation to trees is something that Suzanne discovered and um, facing much derision as she went, but, um, Anyway, uh, so what's interesting and, you know, that goes against uh, all Darwinian thought is that these trees, rather than competing with one another, as scientists have long theorized, your research shows, of course, that these trees cooperate and, you know, bring forth, basically, mm -hmm. with other trees, that, they, mm -hmm. that it's not survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, you know, I would say I would modify that slightly to say that we've we've improved on our understanding of natural selection. It, it still is about survival of the fittest, but survival of the fittest doesn't just mean that I'm going to outcompete my neighbor. It means that I'm going to do I'm going to have a better life. I'll be healthier, fitter, meaning I can produce seeds and carry forward my genes to the next generations if I'm also in community and relationship with my neighbors. So, you know, no tree grows in isolation. They grow in societies and communities and families, just like we do. Um, there is no such thing as an isolated tree, although the foresters in the modern forestry practices pretend or have thought that that's the way to grow trees as, you know, to give them a lot of space, i.e. resources, um, and that they'll grow tall and big and dominate the, the rest of the stand, become dominant. So it's all about dominant, 
dominance, competition, and suppression of your neighbors. And what this new science is showing is that um, that's not that's only part of the picture of fitness. It's only part of the picture of natural selection. That that symbiosis and cooperation is equally, if not more, important than competition. All of these interactions go on all at once. Um, it's like you know we communicate in multiple ways. So do trees and plants. They have ways. They can compete, they can cooperate, they can parasitize each other. They do all kinds of things. They're sophisticated. And all of these things matter in the process of natural selection. That is the, you know, selecting genes for the fitter generations to come. So I would say, you know, what we've done is we've built on Darwin's theory. And I would say that Darwin himself understood that cooperation and symbiosis was an important part of fitness um, and natural selection. But he was in his time, which was when capitalism was really being theorized in Western Europe, um, this idea of competition really took hold in the culture. And culturally, the science was became, um, became um, you know, sort of um, expressed in terms of that culture at the time. And, you know, and the application of it in ecology and forestry and agriculture, that's been the dominant theme. And that has actually led us into all kinds of problems because now we know that these organisms, these trees and plants, that all of these interactions, these relationships, these very sophisticated relationships are important. And yet we've managed our croplands, our cornfields, by reducing, getting rid of competition, adding fertilizers, adding, you know, all the resources that, you know, the dominant corn plant will take or, or a tree. And that's led to uh, loss of biodiversity. It's led to disease. It's led to eutroph eutrophication of the oceans because of the runoff it, not down the Mississippi, for example, into the Gulf of Mexico. There are dire consequences of this misunderstanding of natural selection and all that um, that, that is important in that process. Well, what's interesting is you're, you're a forester and a world famous ecologist, and you, but you come from a family of loggers. <clears throat> and talk a little bit about what the forests, what you learned from being in the forest as a young girl. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, um, I was just a little kid in a family of loggers, like you said, my, my great grandfather, my grandfather, all my great uncles, uh, my dad and all of his brothers were all horse loggers. And so I got to see all that. I, was, I wasn't actually a worker at the time, I was a kid, um, but I was there mm -hmm. and I watched, especially my grandpa and my uncles and my dad, um, you know, to go into a forest it was done with a great deal of care. Everything was slow and small. And so when I say slow, you know, imagine like two, they had two huge draft horses, 2000 pounds each that they had to take up into the bush, you know, and literally up a thousand feet elevation into the forest with all their tools. And my grandfather built his own flumes of birch logs and they would go into a forest and cut maybe one tree in a week or one tree in every couple of days because it was done with crosscut saws or later on with the crosscut chainsaw, which by the way, had two ends to it in the early days. Um, and so it was slow, right? And then to drag those logs over to those flumes and get them in the flumes with their handmade PV pipe poles, which are basically these big, you know, um, spears that you kind of roll the log into the flume and then shoot it down to the lake and down at the lake, um, they would boom them together. And that was my dad's job was to stand on the boom, waiting for these great big logs to come thundering down the flume. And then they would corral them into, into booms. And then in the springtime, send them down uh, the river to the local mill. So it was, it was slow. It was small. Like you know, when I say small, I mean, they would take out one or two trees and a hectare. That means that when you go into that forest, you can barely tell that anything was done. Um, they, the forest immediately fills in with new, new growth, regeneration coming out, like just bursting out of the ground. Um, it, it actually opens up the forest a little bit, allows a little bit of light in. And these forests are meant to, to just grow out of that. It's, it's astounding. Um, but of course, that all changed too. <laughs> But it when changed, you were just, yeah. I'm just wondering when you were, I mean, those, that's very dangerous, very dangerous, uh, you know, those huge logs coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, it, God only knows what speed and what force. <clears throat> um, but just the time that you spent in the forest, I mean, what did you, do you, do you remember what you sort of intuited or what you absorbed? You know, I, I just, I, I, so 
I played in the forest all the time. So my brother and sister and I were, you know, constantly playing in the forest, like, I don't know, throwing dirt lumps at each other, building forts, the building rafts on the lake, swinging, you know, swimming in the trees, climbing the trees, everything that a kid does. But instead of in a playground, we were in an old growth forest. <laughs> and, okay. and that's a really super interesting place with all kinds of berry shrubs and dips and nicks and crannies and places to hide. And, um, you know, it was wonderful. It was, it was the best place ever to be a kid. We, we learned so much about even just survival through the day, you know, you pack your lunch and pick some berries and you're good for, you're good to go. Um, and then of course, as a kid too, I was always really fascinated with the soil. And I, I, don't, I don't mean um, that I discovered it in the forest. I actually discovered soil in the sandbox <laughs> where I was a little kid and I used to eat I used to eat the, the soil or the, the sand all the time when I was a kid, including, you know, the cat poo that got mixed in with the sand and the worms. And, and so I had this, full disclosure. <laughs> full disclosure. Um, and then that just stuck with me, you know. So when I was a kid in the forest, I was always digging around in the soil and picking mushrooms. And, and of course, um, you know, the one day that my our dog fell in the outhouse, that was really fascinating because I got to see the full soil profile, which was like you know, organic matter, and then the A horizon, and the B horizon, and I mean, I, 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 it opened up my world, and later when I went to university, that's what I studied. I studied the soil, and I studied the forest, and how they link together. You know, it's interesting, because um, I was just going to ask you, did, was there a moment where, instead of the forest being the forest, that was just this thing that was there, that it became this other entity that sort of, where you sort of stopped and realized that it was this other thing and you just dis sort of described it. So yeah. it's really, your, you have to thank your cat poop. <laughs> and, and falling out of the tree a few people. times. And your dog falling into the outhouse. There is a theme there, right? <laughs> There's definitely a theme. You know, there. I do have a theory and you know, it's, probably not that original but the theory my theory is that you know what we do what affects us in childhood is what stays with us and what we carry into our heart and what we you know seek out as an adult in in in, in adult forms really mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree and um so you were the only woman among your colleagues of foresters or ecologists later on when you were studying. And describe when you put forth your theories that were first published in 1997, what happened when you did and how, what was that, what was that process? Yeah, so I mean, you know, just to link this back to my childhood. So the, the questions that I asked that ended up in that 1997 Nature publication really fundamentally came from my experience as a child because I, the forest to me was just, it, it's not like it was even a revelation. It was just my experience, right? It was just what I knew in my heart from being there that the forest was right. a connected place. You know, we talked about the connection between climate change and the ice fields. It's the same thing in the forest, but at a smaller scale, everything is connected. Um, and I knew that in my heart, I was connected to the forest. And, and so what I saw, and when I just joined forestry, it was about disconnection. You know, the foresters were disconnecting the earth from the forest, you know, that the, and disconnecting the trees from each other and, and imagining, they were imagining that they were these separate individuals that competed with each other and that they needed to manage those individuals. And so what I did was I was showing that actually that's not true. What, what's happening is that these connections through our practices are being severed. Um, that, that when we take out um, you know, certain species and, uh, and, and clear cut forests, we lose a lot of these connections. And so that's why I think when, when the paper got published, yeah, there was a lot of backlash because we had invested in this sort of you know, neo-Darwinian view of forest management, you know, to manage well, This is the like a century of thought. This is a century of thought you're talking about. It's a century much. of thought and a century also of building an industry around that thought, right? It's like the oil and gas industry, but it's the forest industry. Like you've got all this infrastructure, you've got all these companies, you've got huge investments in, uh, in, in, in stock, stockholders, you've got practices and policies that have been invested in. 
and this on this idea that competition is the dominant theory of how forests are structured. And here I come along, a girl of all things, who asked a girly question about connection. And they're just like, you know, oh my God, it can't, you know, this is just ridiculous. And so I do, I got a lot of backlash. I think that mainly the backlash wasn't so much that the discovery was made or that it was, you know, something a girl would think of to ask that question. It was more that now they, you know, that it felt like a threat a threat to the policies that were entrenched, you know, to the, you know, to this zealous uh, practice of forestry that weeded out plants and got rid of the big trees. And, and they were not going to change that just because I did that study. And so they, and yeah, what so they about, pulled. what about the, the uh, journal that, uh, that agreed to publish it? Who, who was that? I mean, what was that like? So that was nature. Page. Yeah, that was the journal nature, which is like for my field, that's the best place you can publish. Um, it, it was a, it felt like a long shot when I sent the paper off, but you know, <laughs> and I was so neat, naive, it actually got rejected when I first sent it to the editor and they said, oh, there's too much stuff in here. Like I got all these review comments back and, and I was so, you know, if I was older, I would have just said, okay, I give up. I'm not going to, I'm going to go to a lower journal, but instead I was so naive. I just thought, okay, I'll just change it. And, sent, and I sent it back. And within a few days, he, that editor accepted the paper. And so that was, that was transformative for me because um, um, Nature is a big deal journal. It's like the highest journal that you could possibly publish in, in my field. It has a lot of publicity surrounding it. Um, and so everybody knew about it. And so it got elevated to you know, the international stage um, and in the news. And, and so this created even more problems because you know, now there was a little pressure on these foresters to change, um, but of course they, they, didn't, they did not change. Um, and, oh, and one other thing I'll, I'll mention is that Nature actually used, <laughs> put my, my article on the front cover of that issue. And um, and I was so happy because the other one that I would the other one that was competing for the front cover of space was the genome of the fruit fly, which was like the first real genome that had been published, and um, um, and they had this. Big deal. There was a big deal. There was this double helix picture that they were going to put on there, and, and instead they put on a mixed forest um, and called it the Wood Wide Web, and that was that was fabulous. I really I really well, thought you know, that was nature great. deserves a lot of credit for for going out on as they say, a limp, no pun intended. But um, so these old trees can discern which seedlings are their own kin. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how do they do that without, you know, going into a lot of technical stuff? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So but how did you find that out? I mean, that's what's so amazing. Yeah, well, you know, I knew that from our first work, we, we did this, you know, it, it, I, I feel like, you know, I start out really crudely and then get, I get closer and closer to interesting questions as I move along. But we got to the point, I'd done many studies with my grad students showing that, that these old trees nurtured uh, seedlings growing up around them. And we did these experiments where we'd have seedlings connected to these old trees and not connected to the old trees. And then we would compare how they germinated and grew and survived and their biochemistry, how that changed as well. And, and they did, it was significant. They had four times higher survival rate when they could connect to the old trees through their mycorrhizal networks. And so what would be the next logical question if seedlings are being nurtured by these big old trees, the next logical question to me, it wasn't, it wasn't rocket sciences was, could they recognize their own seedlings? Um, and so that, that's how that question came up. And I'd learned about this one scientist in, uh, who had been studying kin recognition in plants in tiny herbaceous plants called sea rockets and nobody knew if this happened in conifers and so I phoned her up and I said hey you know could we try this out let's let's do it and so I got a grad student and we we grew um, seedlings that were full sibling seedlings next to these old trees and then compared them with strangers that we had collected the seed from other trees and then we followed their germination and survival and growth and we labeled the old trees with uh, sugars with carbon-13 and we traced where those carbon molecules went and sure enough we found that they most of it went right into those kin seedlings and they survived better and they grew better and so that process of doing better uh, through recognizing your kin is called kin selection. It's actually selecting the kin for the next generation. So yeah, now, you know, we've done a lot more studies on this and we keep verifying this, that, that this is actually a really important phenomenon in these forests.
You know, I have to admit, I wouldn't have asked that question. Do they recognize their own kin? I mean, it's true, I'm not a forester or an ecologist, but still, I mean, I think the fact that you would want to, you would ask, you would think that, I mean, that's why, that's why you discovered these things. And I didn't. So, um, but it's, but it is interesting to me that how, you know, scientific inquiry works and how, you know, one thing leads to another and, you know, that's how life moves forward, as they mm -hmm. say. Um, so, Talk about the social nature of the forest that's critical for evolution. Yeah, you know, so now we know that forests um, are connected, that they communicate. And when I say communicate, this movement of resources, water, nitrogen, carbon, sugars, amino acids through these networks, even information, information about, you know, the health of a tree or the identity of the tree or the seedling or the neighbors, like, are they related or not? Are they of a different species or not? Are they healthy or not? All that information moves through these networks. And so that you now you imagine, imagine the forest as an internet with all this information going back and forth. And, you know, in forests, um, there are hundreds of species of fungi that are doing this underground. They're all doing it in slightly different ways and slightly different positions in the soil. It's called niche, they're, they're, they're niches or their role in the forest. And so imagine this incredible tapestry of all these different species linking these trees together, doing all these jobs of communicating. And you immediately start to, or at least I do, I start to think of the forest as a social place because it is about their relationships that structures this forest. Um, and that is, that's completely different than how I, you know, went to school and learned about forests. I learned that trees are individuals that just compete with each other, that they're not connected, they don't communicate, that they're just kind of these competitors um, on a, like on a, on a hundred meter dash, who's going to get to the light fastest. And that was, that's completely wrong. Um, they're, they actually grow in societies. Um, there are tree societies. And interestingly, you know, I just spent um, about two weeks with, with a, a, a ch some chiefs from the Kwakwaka'wakw Nation, which is on the west coast of Vancouver, of, or uh, sorry, on the east coast of Vancouver Island, which is on the inside pas passage. And they talked to me about, about the union of human societies with tree societies and how we're integrated together, that people, um, know these trees, they know the individual trees, they're part of the social network of the trees themselves, um, that, that their, um, their language incorporates that knowledge and there are special words that talk about these social relationships among trees, among the people, and between and among the trees and people. So it's fascinating, it's culturally embedded it in all of us at some point back in time. It's still very much part of the First Nations culture, the Aboriginal cultures around the world. It's been part of all of our cultures at some point. And we're just kind of relearning this, that, that forests really are social places. And it's just about really, you know, being attuned and attentive to that rather than blocking it out or just deadening it. Um, you also write about how trees send warning signals and recognition messages and safety dispatches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that and how you came to that. Yeah, so the reason I started looking at that, um, well, there'd already been some work done in the US um, in agricultural plants. So in horticulture and agriculture, looking at herbaceous plants about how plants can actually, um, you know, when one plant is, is attacked by an, a pathogen or an insect uh, infestation, that it can communicate, it will communicate through the air. Uh, these, they're called them volatile organic compounds that are emitted into the air. They're, you know, the more technical term is they're terpenes. They're, they're actually, the chemicals are terpenes and they go into the air and the neighboring trees detect these terpenes and they upregulate their own defense enzymes through changes in their, in their MR in their MR, NRA, their RNA. Um, and, and so it's very spontaneous, very immediate, it, and, and it's a defense strategy that's at a community level. Um, and so I asked when, um, when um, 
our forests were being attacked by the mountain pine beetle in the 1990s, which, by the way, in all of North America, killed 40 million hectares of trees, of logical pine trees. Oh it was gosh. devastating. And so I wanted to know whether as these trees were dying, and it takes four years for a beetle, a tree that's been attacked by beetles to die, is there a process of dying that they can actually prime the next generations um, to be better uh, uh, to be better defended against the next generation of beetles. And so, so that's what we did. We did these experiments where we, um, we actually attacked uh, one tree with, um, with different insects and different pathogens. And then we, they were connected to their neighboring trees. And sure enough, we found that the neighboring trees detected that, you know, that chemistry change in the attack tree. Mm. So trees go through all kinds of biochemical cascading changes when they're under stress, just like we do, right? If I'm, if somebody shouts at me, I have a, a hormonal stress response and I flush and my heart rate goes up and all kinds of, I sweat and all this stuff. Tr plants go through the same thing. It's just different pathways. That's the jasminate mm -hmm. pathway and the salicylic acid pathway. So they, they go through this biochemical change. And some of those chemicals go through these networks and are transmitted to their neighbors, which then upregulate their own genes and they produce these these defense compounds as well. And so that told me, and now we know the next generations are better off when they're in the neighborhood of trees that are dying. Um, and, um, and also these old dying trees transmit energy straight into their, into their, especially their kin, their relatives. They'll, you know, instead of that energy. And don't they, tra do they, do they, tra do they transmit or pass on their wisdom, what they know? They, well, they do. So this is, you know, the collective that I'm talking about here. And, and this is where it gets kind of tricky with our language, right? Um, this wisdom is what I'm measuring in the chemical changes in these plants and the DNA, right? The changes in their actual, the fabric of their RNA and DNA is changed. The chemistry in their bodies is changed. Um, and so that, you know, that is what, when we talk about um, wisdom in ourselves, we're talking, you know, in a biophysical sense, it is how our brains are working, right? It's the chemistry in our brains that houses memory and, and aligns thought. And it's the same thing in plants. And so what I'm measuring here is like I'm putting a stethoscope on the plant and saying, ah, oh, I can detect that change. And so that is the actual machinery of the wisdom or the brains or the intelligence of those trees. And so, yeah. So I don't, we don't have, we're already almost out of time and there are so many other questions I want to ask you. I do want to ask you about, um, uh, well, I can ask you this. I mean, what do you think, what do the forests have to teach us and what have they taught? Yeah, well, so here's, I mean, all kinds of lessons. Um, but going back to Titania, the 2000 year old um, matriarch in the forest and, you know, the cedars that were coming up around her of different ages, those were her offspring. Um, now they're big trees themselves, maybe 500 years, some are 500, 800 years old, 400, some are children, you know, seedlings. Um, mm -hmm. That this is a community and at the center is the, is the elder. And I think that is something that we can learn so much from these forests is that these elders are hugely important in, in the um, integrity of forests, that they're passing on the vital lessons of how to survive in the environment, um, in a changing environment even, because those genes, you know, the genes that is that has spawned these other trees as well, um, have been through a lot of climatic upheaval in the past, and that's encoded in their DNA. And so that's passed on into their offspring and so that they actually have that, uh, that DNA, that, that ability to produce enzymes and different chemicals that will help them defend themselves against changing climatic conditions. So saving these matriarchs in the forest is an absolutely crucial um, it's absolutely crucial to our forest being able to cope with climate change and to carry forward and be resilient. In other words, be able to reproduce. And so in society, I think we can draw a direct link here to how we've looked at COVID and how we've treated our elder people in nursing homes and 
Do they really belong there? Or should we be integrating back into the communities and looking after them there? I don't know. But for me, I know that one thing I did is I made sure that my mom wasn't going to go into a home, even though she's 85 and has some dementia. And my dad did not go into a home. So um, I wanted to protect them against, against that thing that is actually a global change phenomenon. COVID is a global change phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, you know, partly from looking at these old trees, the value of these old trees, they're the ones that bring, you know, that are going to be the next, you know, they're the ones that are going to propel us forward. They're the foundation for the next generations. And without them, we don't have the same resilience. So are there, I, I can't, I don't think there are any questions. So if there aren't, well, let me ask, are there questions? Uh, this is, okay. So um, bef before I ask uh, this question, um, what are the three or five things that people can do? Right. That everybody listening to this can do that are simple steps. I mean, nothing simple as far as anything is concerned, but that people, the actions that people can take yeah. So they feel like they're contributing and are contributing. Yeah. Well, as you know, when we started out, you know, we talked a little bit about the climate crisis that the United Nations just declared. Um, this means that we're at this crossroads. We have choices here and we can choose to go down a path of uh, continuing um, unraveling and collapse, or we can go down a path of, of, um, of regener regenerative path. And that path, which I will hope for my daughters that we pick that right path, the right hand path. Um, there are two things that we really need to do. One of them is of course, decarbonize our energy sector. And the second thing is to not cut down our old growth forests, which are huge storehouses of carbon and biodiversity. And by the way, those two things are tightly interlinked. The reason some ecosystems are rich in carbon, including all the West Coast forests, the tropical rainforests, the boreal forests, is because um, of the diversity in those forests as well. Diversity begets carbon storage. Um, and, and so the second thing then is, is to save our old growth forests. And you know, it's hard to believe that you know, even where I'm from, you know, we're fighting a battle out at Fairy Creek, which is the last teardrop of a landscape left that, that has not been harvested of these 2000 year old trees. And we're fighting the companies not to go and cut down these trees because these are the carbon storehouses of the world. This is our actual life support system. Um, and so that's one thing you can do is you can, you can um, donate to, uh, to uh, organizations that are fighting for the last old growth, whether it's in the tropics, the, the, the boreal forest. Do you or the have on forest. your website or can you put someplace where people can go and I get do. a link? And... Yes. Um, there's... I mean, you don't have to put it up now, but I mean, just okay. on your. Okay, I can. I have um... a, a website called the mothertree.org. And um, there is a link to uh, the Ancient Forest Alliance and you can, you can donate there. And the, their cause is to help protect old growth forests. Okay, so here's the question and we know the answer. And that is, the question is, would it be possible to make a difference in the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by planting lots of new trees? If so, what kinds? And you are, you are involved in a program called the Mother Tree Project. And why don't you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So just, uh, so I mentioned, don't, you know, we need to stop cutting our old growth forest. There's, that is the, the key thing to do. Planting trees is also important, but it's gonna take us hundreds of years to recover the carbon capital of old growth forest. And a plantation is gonna take a long, long time. We don't have that kind of time. So the first thing is to protect these old forests that still exist. In the degraded forest or, or forest that we want to a forest, that means bring back into forest. Yes, we have to be really careful about it. And there are big movements around the world to do this. Like you've probably heard of the Trillion Tree Initiative. And that idea is to go and plant trees where trees used to be or, or where we think that they might be suited um, as climate changes into the future. Um, but the key thing here is it's got to be done right. Um, so in the Mother Tree Project, which is a big project I run um, in, in British Columbia, we're actually doing this. It's a, it's a, a 900 kilometer long project. Uh, so it crosses a big climate gradient and we're 
we're saving these old trees, these old growth trees in different patterns, and then uh, allowing them to self-regenerate and also planting in trees um, to augment the natural regeneration and actually migrating genotypes of trees. So think about it as climate changes, the velocity of climate change is really super fast. It's way faster than any tree can migrate on its own or mutate and adapt. Um, so we've got to have a hand in this and help them out. And so what we're finding is that we can do that, that we can migrate trees and they will do well and they'll do really well. In fact, they do 30% better survival if we plant them around the old mother trees because the old mother trees protect them and they provide a network for them to link into. And so that those seedlings can actually get through their early years, which are their most vulnerable years. And so there, it, it now, the name work, of this right? project is the mother tree project and can people, uh, is there a, a link somewhere that people can go to, yeah. to yes, give you can, or? Yeah, it's or, called mothertreeproject.org um, or you can just go to Google and type in mother tree project and it'll come right up. Um, and you can find out lots about it. And, and also, um, you know, you can donate to, to the project. We always need money <laughs> to keep this project going because it's such a huge project. And we're, we're thinking actually of, of expanding it to, to, to make an institute out of this, an uh, ancient forest institute, and expand the project so that it goes further south into the United States as well as along, along the coastal regions because it is so promising, right? It's got solutions. And people can go into these forests. Oh, now, wait a minute. Them. Let's talk about that. I mean, you would you an institute would be really interesting. And is there, you know, do you need people to uh, invest in this or to support it or what? Yes, we we do. And so I've been I've just started um, collaborating with a number of people on the coast of British Columbia who are linked with various organizations, and we've decided that we're going to set up this institute this ancient forest institute and we need you know we're going to need to set up some kind of endowment and funding in order to um, establish it and what we want to do is work with our aboriginal people um, and have a presence or uh, 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 laboratories in in the territories of the major first nations along the coast so that includes the Coast Salish, the Nechanath, the Kwakwakawa, the Haltzik, the Haida, the Tlingit, the Simsian. So, so many nations, and they're so excited and interested in doing this. Um, and I've been working with them and building these relationships for years. And now we finally settled on this idea that we're going to set up this institute with all of these actual lab laboratories right in the forest in their territories where their people are being trained and they're figuring out these forest practices for the future. And we can all go there and learn, you know, how to see the forest in a different way and manage forests in these ways that blend the old with the new, the, the Aboriginal science with the Western science, which is really the way forward, in my view. Um, okay, here's a question. What are the, what are the arguments for bringing trees and plant life that are natural and historic to our environment? into our personal landscape? Yeah, um, it's really important. So, I mean, one of the key things, um, I think that, you know, one of the questions I've been getting lately is what is an old growth forest or what does it look like? People have, um, don't have the opportunity to see them anymore. There are very few people, or what does, what does an intact forest ecosystem look like? What does a healthy forest look like? And, and it's because we've deforested and ch changed, you know, changed land, but we need to, you know, re restore a lot of these places. And so bringing in the native plants and the native trees is absolutely essential. They're the ones that are adapted to those places. Even the fungi and, you know, the fungi in the soil are locally adapted. And so that's the best chance we have is bring in local adapted trees, maybe migrate some new ones in that are from warmer climates so that they have a place to go um, to, to get fostered into those home, into the, the, that home community. But it is, it is absolutely crucial that we, that we, we uh, emphasize the natural, the native species that, that belong there. So this is author night, so I just like to ask you, I mean, you, you, this is all uh, written beautifully in this book that we published. And um, so talk a little bit about the writing of the book and what surprised you of anything about your writing it, what you learned from it, the experience of it. 
Yeah, um, it was exhausting. <laughs> um, I think that that's right. Yeah, um, I learned so much. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I knew I, I wanted to tell the story of the science so that anybody could understand it and want to read it. I'd already published, you know, over 200 journal articles of my research and it didn't move the needle on anything. You know, we still don't incorporate this science into, into how we manage our forests or see our forests. And that's true for all kinds of science, right? We've got done so much, we know so much, and yet it doesn't make it into the public mind. And so I wanted to do that. So I had to learn how to write like that, how to write a story somebody would want to read and absorb the science at the same time. Um, and so I, you know, I learned as I went. And the other thing I, I wanted to, as I was doing it, because I'm trained as a scientist, right? I'm a Western scientist. And a Western scientist is really, you, you get hammered home that, you know, your objective and your, you know, you don't anthropomorphize and you don't personify and you don't bring yourself to this. And as I went through it, I, real, I realized, and I, I kind of knew that, I, of course, I knew this beforehand, but it became more evident to me that I had to, I had to bring myself right into it. And I had to use the words that are taboo in science in order to express what I was trying to convey. And so I really had to work through myself, you know, as a scientist, what, how was I going to express this? And then I had to realize that I was going to have to take the flack that came my way when I use those words. And certainly I have had to do that. But I've learned also along the way that there are many languages, not, you know, the English language is actually very depopulate in words that describe the things that I was finding out, right? That there are words in these ancient Aboriginal languages that talk about communication between trees and fungi and people, that they don't have to use words like intelligence and uh, wisdom that uh, usually we use for human beings. There's whole languages with multiple words, ancient words that describe these phenomena. And it's embedded, that language is embedded in the knowing the land and the way of the land and looking after the land. So it's not foreign at all, it's part of you. Um, so I've learned that along the way and I've embraced it. And, and I realize, you know, this is the crux of, of us solving our problems is we we've all got to embrace this worldview of that we're all connected our the trees are our relations as well you know there are tree people and there are our squirrel people and our soil people and fungal you know we're all in this together and and we you know the sooner we embrace this again the quicker we can solve our problems well the scientific conclusions are speaking of science, uh, are impossible to ignore, that the forest is wired for wisdom, sentience, <clears throat> and healing, and we have much to learn from all of them. And Finding the Mother Tree, I have to say, is a, it's a deeply personal and affecting story of family, of love, of life and death, of revelation. And please make sure everyone to buy, if you haven't already, Suzanne's magical book, Finding the Mother Tree. Suzanne, thank, thank you very much for this. This was a wonderful conversation. And thank you all for supporting East Hampton Library. And thank you for joining us. And we look forward to your institute, which I hope is going to eventually come to the United States and affect life here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. And thank you also, Rebecca, for hosting this. <laughs>